Mark Legon, President of Freedom House. Thank you for coming to our new home and a word about that home. Um, this is our principal conference space and uh, we are calling this the Mark Palmer Conference Room. The late Mark Palmer was a U.S. diplomat, U.S. ambassador to Hungary, and when he was, he was out in the streets with the people calling for the change in the communist era. He was a, an entrepreneur, and for many years, Mark Palmer, from 1995 to 2008, was vice chair of the Board of Freedom House. In that role and in other <coughs> He was a particularly tireless and innovative voice about helping civil society <coughs> around the world fight dictatorships and democracies. This is Mark Palmer. Um, in this room, uh, we will use with joy uh, in his memory. We will also, in this room, have a number of events dubbed the Mark Palmer Forum, including um, an annual conference in which we will bring together, hopefully with Freedom House playing a, a role um, as a cultivator of a coalition of organizations to talk about how to help civil society in practice fight the very problems that the Freedom in the World Report focuses on. Today, as we roll out the Freedom in, uh, in the World Report for 2015, I want to thank emphatically the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Lilly Endowment, the Schloss Family Foundation, Kim Davis on our board, the Earhart Foundation, and additionally, the 21st Century ILG UW Heritage Fund, the Reed Foundation, Leonard Sussman and the Sussman Freedom Fund, and our board member, Diana Negroponte, without whom we would not be able to produce this report. Um, their generous um, support is enormously important. We will today, and I will leave to our experts um, to talk about the substance, look at an assessment of the world that shows as a theme that autocracy often causes terrorism and freedom and human rights are immensely diminished by terrorism. We will look at a pattern in the world of more brazen rejection of democratic standards and use of crude authoritarian methods. A decline in freedom has continued for some almost a whole decade. And this should not be um, a reason for despair because it may be that the white knuckle grip of autocrats is a sign not of their confidence but of their fear. I am confident three and a half weeks into my tenure that innovation and aspirations for freedom lie on the side of those who long to put in place democracy around the world. And Freedom House is here to assist them practically. Um, I really want to thank two members of the team who produced the Freedom in the World Report who are here. And in particular, Sarah Rapucci, who was the coordinator of the project, um, and Elena Gakin, who's here. Um, they, uh, it's on their shoulders that, um, and others that this report was um, produced. I'm especially pleased um, to introduce my colleague, Arch Puddington, who's Vice President for Research here at Freedom House, who will summarize the findings of the report. Arch leads the researchers and writers who uh, are at the heart of the Freedom of the World Project. And after he presents the main findings of the report, I'm really pleased um, that our friend, uh, Jill Doherty, uh, will moderate a panel discussion. Jill's former White House correspondent, foreign affairs correspondent, and Moscow bureau chief for CNN. She's now a public policy scholar at the Wilson Center's Institute. So, Arch, tell us about the book. Thanks, Mark. So, um, I gave uh, something akin to this presentation uh, to a um, government agency um, this week, and uh, I started out saying, uh, this is not a boom and doom report, and at the end of the presentation, one of the audience said, but it is a boom and doom report. So I said, okay, uh, I'll change that. It's a boom report, but not a doom report. Um, I want to start with several 
uh, large, broad trends that we've uh, identified as having a major effect on the decline in freedom that we discern this year for the ninth and second year. Uh, the first thing is terrorism. Um, terrorism has been a factor in our schools for really quite some time, but never to the degree uh, that it was in 2014. Uh, there is a swath of countries starting in West Africa, uh, moving on to parts of the Middle East, and then moving on to parts of South Asia, where Islamic terrorists uh, conducted massacres, they kidnapped people, they forced uh, uh, populations into exile, they made areas of, uh, wide areas of countries ungovernable. They stepped up their campaigns to annihilate uh, religious minorities, uh, especially uh, Muslim sects that they disapprove of. Um, and they kidnapped and seized as um, as uh, prizes of war, uh, women and girls, uh, all throughout this region. So, from just simply a human standpoint, uh, terrorism was a major factor. Second, the terrorism, the, this upsurge in terrorism, laid bare the weaknesses and corruption in government after government, uh, government that uh, created enabling environments for uh, the spread of terrorism. Uh, the best example here is Nigeria, where you have a military that's been hollowed out by corruption, bad training, bad tactics. Where you have a civilian government that has been uh, remarkably passive in the face of uh, a major crisis. Uh, and finally, this upsurge in terrorism has uh, encouraged major authoritarian powers to exploit terrorism as a justification for a stepped up campaign of repression against uh, their own critics. Uh, an example here would be China. Uh, the way the Chinese have um, have treated the Uyghur question by uh, labeling all Uyghur activists as terrorists. A second trend that we've noticed uh, has to do with the tactics that are being employed by what we call modern authoritarians. Now, modern authoritarians are countries like uh, Russia, Venezuela, Iran, uh, China, uh, uh, countries that have devised uh, more nuanced and sophisticated methods of, of, of maintaining political control that are more uh, in sync with the uh, 21st century than was the case during the 20th century when more ham-fisted tactics uh, or usually on the table. And we've seen over the past year or so a hardening of these tactics and a reaching back into the 20th century for some of the tactics that authoritarian powers and dictatorships used at the time to maintain control and that are now being dredged up and used today. Um, Ten years ago, for example, political prisoners uh, there were very few political prisoners around the world. And today you see political prisoners uh, uh, by the hundreds in China, in Azerbaijan, in Bahrain, in uh, Egypt, uh, in Venezuela. Um, you've seen Russia and China um, reach back for one of the most uh, tawdry uh, tactics of the Cold War, and that is the use of psychiatric incarceration to deal with dissidents. So we've seen, uh, and, and we've also seen uh, a, a further shrinking of the space for independent media, uh, where 10 years ago or so, there was a kind of strategy whereby you would allow some newspapers and certainly the internet 
as places where critics could have their say. Today, uh, more and more you see hardly any space among traditional media for critical voices, and uh, especially in the past year, a whole slew of repressive measures um, that were adopted to deal with uh, internet freedom. Finally, we're seeing authoritarian uh, leaders express open contempt for liberal democratic values, where in the past they would have claimed to be aspiring to achieve societies that adhere to these values, but they would they had problems, they would reach these goals uh, in their own time, at their own pace, <coughs> and uh, in keeping with the, um, the unique cultures uh, of their own societies. Now, they don't even go through the process of making those kinds of qualifiers. They just simply say, as Putin said, um, Europe, uh, uh, European values are degenerate, or, or uh, they uh, echo um, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban in speaking of illiberal democracy and in praising uh, as models for good governance Singapore, Russia, China, and Turkey. Uh, or in, um, in echoing President Erdogan, who told a delegation of press freedom advocates recently, um, we don't need an independent press in Turkey. So this year, um, we always look, uh, one of the things we look at in our report is how the, the most important countries that are also uh, suffering from some kind of uh, democracy deficit, whether uh, things are in contestation or things are moving in the wrong direction or uh, things are just up in the air, um, how are they doing? And what we found this year is that the countries that we've been looking at, the important strategic and uh, economic, uh, economically and strategic countries, uh, we found that in almost every case, they were either doing uh, worse than a year before, or at best they were stagnating. Russia declined. Azerbaijan declined. Belarus stagnation. China stagnation. Um, Egypt, Bahrain, Syria declined. Um, Nigeria, Kenya declined. Venezuela, Ecuador declined. Hungary and Turkey declined. So in the most important authoritarian countries or countries that seem to be moving in the wrong direction, this past year was not uh, a good year. Um, okay, so we have the math there. Um, uh, we, this was the ninth consecutive year in which there were more declines than gains. There were 61 declines, 33 gains. That's a pretty wide gap. Uh, there were <coughs> Uh, 51 not free countries. Uh, if you go back to 1972 when we began the <coughs> freedom of the world, that's not a bad figure. But if you consider the post Cold War period, uh, we haven't seen that many not free countries since 1997. Uh, all right, I'll go back 92. There. So that just shows you this is the, the nine years of decline. Uh, the, the, the deep purple there is, uh, are the gains, and the, uh, the salmon color is the, uh, the declines. Uh, let's go take a look at how some of the regions we're doing. So, um, Latin America, the, uh, there are three important stories. One is the Chavista model, uh, uh, mercifully, is no longer considered a model for anything but failure. Uh, second point, uh, there has been a toxic combination of, of narco violence, uh, bad governance, corruption that has uh, crippled efforts to consolidate the, the uh, democracy gains in Mexico and throughout Central America. 
And we saw a lot of this in the past year. Uh, third, over there on the right, you see a very narrow purple band. That's Cuba. Cuba is the only purple state in the hemisphere. And uh, of course, it's in the news today because of the change in American policy. Uh, our one comment about Cuba is that it's very clear what the strategy of the Cuban leadership is. Uh, they have gone to China, they've gone to Vietnam, they've studied these countries. Um, the Cuban leadership has used this phrase, we want uh, socialism with capitalism, that is to say, but, but they don't add freedom. Um, so their, their goal is to replicate something along the lines of Vietnam or China, and that's what we have to be monitoring over these next few years. Um, let's go to the next um, slide. Eurasia. Now, Eurasia um, had some uh, positive signs last year in Georgia, in Moldova, and in, especially in Ukraine. But by and large, this was yet another uh, dismal year for the region. If you look at the, um, the uh, indicators that we use to measure a uh, country's uh, level of freedom. The Eurasian countries are only slightly better than the Middle East and have been in decline for really not the past 10 years, but the past 15 years. Um, let's move ahead. I know, one back. All right, the uh, Middle East. Uh, okay, so in the Middle East, we have one bit of really good news, and that is Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia, we rank as a free country. Uh, it is the first Arab country to be scored as free since the early 1970s when uh, Lebanon uh, uh, got that um, ranking. Uh, but aside from Tunisia, the News was almost all pretty gloomy. There were declines in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, <coughs> in uh, um, Yemen, in Kuwait, uh, in Lebanon. So many, many declines, but a major, major uh, improvement. Um, we'll get to Africa in one of the other slides. OK, let's move ahead. Uh, these, are, these are the countries <coughs> that have shown the most significant gains and the most significant decline over the past uh, one year. And if you look on the decline side, six of those 10 countries, uh, their scores were uh, affected in major ways by coups or by civil wars or by a combination of civil conflict and post-coup uh, uh, post situations. Uh, on the right-hand side, several of those countries like Fiji, uh, Madagascar, Guinea Bissau uh, were, in, were recovering from post-coup situations compared to their improvements. Um, let's move along. Very quickly, this is just a chart that we did up to show uh, how important a country's uh, political environment is uh, to the possibility that terrorism will be a factor in that society. Um, you look at the uh, number of uh, fatalities from terrorist attacks, that's on the right-hand side, 2% uh, in free countries, uh, and uh, most came in not free societies. So the enabling environment uh, is critical there. Okay. Well, why don't we move for time's sake? Let's move ahead. Um, all right. This is an interesting uh, chart because it shows you countries that have declined from not free, from partly free to not free over the past five years. And uh, this uh, is an indication of the problems that Africa is facing today. Um, Ten years ago, uh, we looked at Africa as the region of the world 
uh, that had the most potential for a breakthrough in democracy. And in fact, things have moved in reverse over the past decade. And you can see there that there are a number of countries that we had scored as partly free that are now uh, scored as not free. In the past year, uh, please note, Uganda uh, joined the not free ranks. Um, and there are serious capacity problems, governance problems, uh, terrorism problems, coup problems uh, that are, uh, and, and problems of leaders who aspire to the leader for life um, uh, um, a community. Uh, so uh, that has left Africa um, in a worse state than it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, there have been some positive developments. Tunisia is number one. Uh, it didn't happen during 2014, but the recent elections in Sri Lanka, we noted, uh, uh, are uh, potentially quite important. Um, the upsurge in civil society, the pushback in places like Ukraine and Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, were positive developments, and the kind of good, bad uh, developments in countries like Venezuela and Russia where the, the uh, systems of autocracy that have been built up over the past decade or so are starting to fray rather considerably. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, Jill, uh, we can assemble the panel and move on. Thank you. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, serving in that post until January of 2012. And there, she was coordinating U.S. policy on democracy and human rights. And then we have Jim right here, Jim Mann, uh, a very distinguished, I can attest to that, a former foreign correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. He's written a number of books about China and American foreign policy. And he's now author in residence at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. So um, I'll just give kind of a lay of the land in terms of the timing here. It's now almost 9.30, and we're going to end in about an hour. So we have a mission here to get through a lot of material. I thought we'd talk for maybe 40 minutes. We'll see how it goes. We may cut that down in order to give more questions. The questions will start after that, and I'm hoping we can get you know, maybe 20, even 30 minutes of questions, depending, you can always go back and forth. So, I, you know, I just want to start with the overall picture. I, I'm reading the quotes here, are, you know, exceptionally grim, et cetera. So as both of our experts were reading this, uh, tomorrow, let's begin with you. It, are you, is it an exceptionally, for you, exceptionally grim report? And were you surprised by it? I, I don't think I was uh, surprised, and I, I have to underscore uh, the bright notes that, that are pointed to, including Tunisia, uh, but also the opportunities that the report uh, notes in places that are not currently in the free category, but may be moving in the right direction. So yes, it's grim in the aggregate, but there are some places to focus on. What really uh, jumped out at me is building off uh, the report's key theme of the relationship between terrorism and autocracy, uh, the denial of rights making states more vulnerable to terrorism, and terrorism, of course, impeding rights and liberties. I would actually broaden this finding to conflict more generally, and I think um, this comes through in the report's narrative. Uh, the report notes that Syria, in the grip of this horrific civil war, 
that has killed hundreds of thousands posts its worst score ever, uh, that Libya has moved into the not free category. But I would note that Yemen is scored the same as Libya. Iraq is scored the same as Libya. And these are fragile states. These are states that attempted moves in a democratic direction. But the fragility of their political institutions is um, leading to an upsurge in domestic conflict and also the emergence of terrorism. Terrorism is uh, finding a fertile environment where state institutions break down where democracy is not working for people. And so it really um, emphasized to me the need to invest in some of those opportunities that the report points out. Fragile democracies like Tunisia or Mongolia um, that are relatively new in their democratic traditions or states that are in transition toward democracy like Nepal. Um, and it also seems to me that there's a vulnerability that's worth paying attention to in fragile autocracies, uh, countries where despite uh, repression, state institutions are not functioning well, dissent is increasing, societies are polarized. And I would point to places like Venezuela, where the fall in oil prices is likely to have dramatic political effects. Uh, and, and one hopes that that's a society that can avoid state breakdown and conflict. Or Egypt, where despite resurgent autocracy, uh, there is an insurgency growing. So to me, there are opportunities uh, that we can that we can focus on as a result of this lesson of the link between democracy and conflict, but there are also vulnerabilities. Thank you. Jim, you know, before this began, we were chatting about China, which is a huge subject, of course, but um, let's start with kind of a broader idea. Maybe you, you kind of suggested it. What has changed? What has remained the same? Because this is a model, maybe we can talk about that later, but China is emerging as a model for certain countries. So what changed, what remains is that? Um, first of all, as, um, as I've written in the past, uh, China never quite uh, merited the view that um, many Americans, particularly among the elites, had, which was that China was gradually opening up the trade and investment were going to um, lead to political liberalization and democracy. That was never um, in the running. Um, so that, and in that sense, Chinese repression is the same. There have been some changes. Um, and I think this last year was probably, um, things are, the repression is getting so tight um, that I begin to wonder whether it can be maintained at this level. What do I mean? Well, one of the kind of catchphrases about China over the last, say, 15 or 20 years is this country's worked out a uh, unstated deal um, with the Chinese people. If you don't engage in direct political activity, you can go about your lives and you really won't see the repression. Um, and that's become less and less tenable. Uh, why? Well, think of how much, what percentage of your lives uh, you spend online and with the internet. Um, obviously, the Chinese people um, spend an equal amount of time online or close to equal. Um, and the internet is getting ever more controlled. And that's only the start of the story. Um, as an example of the way things are headed in China and how this bargain is breaking down, uh, I was in a, um, in a discussion um, a, a couple months ago um, with uh, someone from the Chinese news media who happened to be in this country, and I was talking about um, internet censorship. And uh, the person looked at me and was not quite agreeing, but didn't say anything um, for a while. I thought I was going to get kind of a, a lecture, um, a, a government point of view. Um, and then the journalist piped up and said, actually, you Americans only understand the part of it. You know the internet controls. What you don't, that's only part one. Part two is, in the last couple of years, everybody uh, has to register to even um, any website or to even exist on the internet. Uh, I had read that. 
Part three that you don't see is at our work units, we are required to post something positive about the country um, or our work at least two or three times a week. Um, that's the kind of things we don't see from afar. And I don't think they can sustain this at this level. I mean, I've, I've been in the past uh, argued that, that you know, what you see, that China's authoritarian system is enduring, but I think maybe not at this level. Um, just to mention a couple of other changes. The past pattern with, in China, with Chinese repression was a kind of periodicity. Things would open up for a while, and then they would um, clamp back down. If it was before the Olympics, if it was before a major visit, things would open up, the visits would end, the Olympics would end, things would tighten back up. We're not seeing that now. Um, that is, that there are no periods of, of um, easing. Uh, and the reason I think, and this goes more generally to the, the problems that other countries face, but China is a model, is that as society opens up to cell phones and everything else, the leaders turn to the security agencies and say, make sure that this is under control. And the Chinese government is relying more than it ever did on the security agencies. And the security agencies are asking for greater and greater control because they are scared. Uh, this is what Mark uh, was saying before. I think the, the um, repressive agencies in China are more fearful than they used to be. So that does represent a significant change. You know, Archie, I'm going to um, ask you, it's kind of a broader question, but you mentioned this, um, uh, this, this trend in modern authoritarian governments, as you would describe them, open contempt for democratic values, which leads me into uh, the, this question, which was, you just mentioned, this kind of social contract or the bargain. You stay, you, people of whatever the country is, stay out of politics, and we'll give you a good life. You'll be able to afford all sorts of things. You have trips to Europe, et cetera, and life will be good. Just don't get involved in politics. And this, I can see it in the country that I follow, which is Russia. It's been mentioned here in connection with China. And I wanted to ask Arch, is this a model? Is there a model emerging that other countries might aspire to, which is in opposition to um, Western democratic models? I think that in recent years, uh, some leaders have the aspiration to create such a model. I think that there, it doesn't exist today uh, because of the many complexities and the and internal contradictions uh, that you find in all these societies because they're dealing uh, in an environment <coughs> in which the level of openness is so significantly different than it was during the communist period. In the communist period, they, they made these kind of uh, social contracts with their people as well. Uh, you know, don't, don't uh, involve yourself in politics and uh, things will get better. Of course, they won't get better at a rapid pace and you won't be able to travel abroad, but you'll be able to uh, build a dacha and, and, and send your children to uh, better schools. Um, that social contract collapsed when the communist system could no longer perform that analogy. And uh, I think the, this effort to create a counter system to liberal democracy is going to run into serious problems when in Russia, in Venezuela, in Iran, uh, uh, and in the smaller countries in Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan and, and uh, elsewhere, they can't generate economic growth anymore. They can't, um, they, they can't fulfill the government's part of the market. And, and yet China still, I mean, there, there's, it's uh, not growing as fast as it was, but it is growing and it has improved the lives of many people. So where does that put that, that contract? There are many uh, concerns in China right now that ordinary uh, 
people whose, uh, whose economic lives have improved over the years are not, are not signing. Well, one is certainly is the, not the, 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 that they are, they are, there are problems that have emerged that the newly wealthy or the newly middle class Chinese are finding uh, that threaten this social contract. For example, air pollution. Uh, the level of pollution is so significant in some of these uh, cities that you now find Chinese talking about uh, moving to the countryside. Uh, you see ch young Chinese uh, wanting education in the West and wanting to stay in the West because they are concerned about the lack of freedom uh, in their own society. So I think that you are, you are, what you, what's happening is that in a quiet sort of a way, you're building a level of discontent uh, that the leadership is trying to tamp down or occasionally will, uh, will talk to and will try to uh, initiate reforms from the top. But there's, I think there's uh, a, a limit to how long that kind of system can succeed. Mm -hmm. And then two more ideas. Well, I, I, you want to follow up with me? I'll just jump in with a very quick question. Mm -hmm. Also, we were discussing this a, a little while ago. Um, is democracy really delivering for people? Right, and, and I think that's part of what we have to um, we have to realize is that there's a global context here. These uh, autocratic states that are attempting to put forward an alternative model uh, can look very good in comparison to uh, Europe and the United States during the last five years of incredible global recession. So uh, open societies with open markets, um, people are going to feel the pain of that global recession much more directly. They're, they will make their leaders in democracies pay for it in a way that leaders in autocracies are insulated from. And um, because a country like China is, OK, you know, it's trying to open its markets in certain ways, but this is a very managed economy, um, it can moderate in certain ways the impact of the global recession on its own population. And of course, if you're coming out of dire poverty, um, your relative improvement can still be significant even when the global middle class is suffering. So, you know, Western democracies or open societies with open markets don't look so great in comparison. And then, of course, when you add to that the challenges that Europe in particular, but in our own way, the United States, have faced politically in addressing these economic questions, uh, the debate over the Eurozone, the Greek, you know, look at the backlash in the Greek elections that just occurred. It raises a lot of questions about the effectiveness of liberal democracies in addressing the needs of people, and the autocrats jump on that uh, as a reason to justify their authoritarianism. Jim, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, with, with China, I think they're becoming victims of their own economic success at this particular phase. Uh, that is, the um, many millions of people who have come out of poverty in, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, that's now uh, starting to be taken as a given. Um, and so out in the countryside, there is something the Chinese call, have long called red-eye disease. That's their name for jealousy. Um, so there's, you know, people now take it for granted they're not going to be living um, hand to mouth. More importantly, for, for politics, uh, the middle classes, I think, over the last 10 years have developed concerns that um, I don't think I really imagined could have come up this strongly 10 years ago. Um, so uh, one, we've mentioned um, internet controls are kind of taken by middle class Chinese as sort of an insult to their intelligence, I think. Um, second, pollution, even more than Arch mentioned, is a huge middle class concern. People, you know, wealthy Chinese talk about getting their kids out of the country. Um, for all of the efforts uh, that by the United States government, uh, halting as they admit may have been to talk about political freedom or to do things on behalf of dissidents in China, the most successful, uh, important thing the United States government has done in the last 10 or 
12 years, is to not, not back down when um, the Chinese authorities ask the U.S. Embassy in Beijing to stop posting their independent pollution readings every day. Um, that is, the Chinese government did not want an independent reading of how, just how bad the pollution was. Uh, the U.S. government said, um, look, this is an objective thing. This is not some subjective. We don't make up the pollution. Uh, hugely important. And the third thing is product safety. So middle class ch Chinese get um, extremely upset that they can't trust what they, you know, the milk uh, and other products they buy in the stores. So that has, you know, that there are plenty of reasons for middle class Chinese now to be less uh, content with this bargain than they used to be. The problem um, and where things stand now is that there is almost no vehicle to um, express that consent. Uh, the press controls mean that there are limits on the extent to which um, the press can report on them. And there are things standing. Mm -hmm. um, Arch, I, I, I want to get to questions pretty soon, but um, how did Tunisia do it? How, you know, the, the right story here is to Tunisia. What did they do specifically to improve this? Well, I, I'd say several things. One is that uh, in the end, different political forces in the country, the Islamists, the secularists, the different parties, uh, the, even the uh, people from the old Ben Ali uh, regime, uh, made important compromises and agreements to uh, enable the country to go forward to protect the democratic achievements that have been uh, seen right after the Arab Spring. Um, so that, and then there were good elections, uh, good elections for the head of state, good elections for parliament. Uh, the various factions within the uh, uh, political class uh, got together and compromised and came up with a good constitution. Uh, there are a uh, pretty um, impressive array of civil liberties that you have in Tunisia today as compared to other Arab societies. Uh, so for all these reasons, I think what you've got is um, a relative success here. Um, I, uh, it, it's very fragile. And, uh, things could move in the wrong direction there just as quickly as they have uh, in other societies. Look, um, under Erdogan, uh, Turkey, in the first five years of Erdogan's government, uh, we saw things moving in the right direction. The elections were better, uh, there were more pluralistic institutions, uh, there were efforts to uh, have better relations with the Kurds and to relax you know, some of the, the controls on minorities. Uh, and now we see what's happened in the second five years of his leadership. So in these fragile new democracies, things can very much go the wrong way. But uh, right now, uh, the fact that you've got political leaders uh, from all the different factions willing to make compromises uh, for the good of um, a Tunisian democracy is very important. You know, can I add just one element there? I agree with everything Arch laid out. I think, though, that the political leaderships, um, whether it was the interim government right after the revolution in Tunisia, the Islamist led coalition government that ultimately shepherded through the constitution, or the government that was just elected. Uh, they, they got to the point of compromise in part um, because of pressure from civil society and with the help of civil society. The first interim government could never have gotten as many Tunisians to vote as voted in that first election if it hadn't been for the Tunisian civil society organizations that showed people how to vote and where to vote and who was running and held candidate forums. The constitutional compromises were to do it across civil society and not put pressure on the constituent assembly to get the job done. 
this new government now is facing pressure from civil society not only to continue uh, that tradition of pluralism and compromise, but to deliver economically. And this is the big challenge, uh, because they can't do that just by making the right decisions. They need outside help. Uh, it's a small country, it's only 10 million people. Um, but uh, there are parts of the country that are really underdeveloped, uh, and there are parts along the coast that have a lot of opportunity, but their, their opportunity is linked to the European economy. So Europe needs to do its part. The United States, I think, has a big role to play in supporting Tunisia economically and rewarding that society and its political leadership for making the good choices that they've made. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of outside help, let's do one more question. Jim, you will be the, uh, the person to answer it, I hope. Um, and then we'll go to questions. Outside help, okay, in uh, my part of the world that I look at, outside help is uh, color revolutions. It is non-governmental organizations that supposedly come into countries and foment revolution uh, on behalf of the West, etc. And I'm sure that this is it, that is a common theme in a number of different countries. So, um, how does the outside world, how does outside help come in if they, uh, number one, right now are being constricted by the governments, but also philosophically? I mean, does the West? have to go around telling everybody how to build democracy? Or does can Tunisia do it itself? What, what do you think? This is, I know, a well, hot debate, but. Right. Um, in this, I think Putin was a couple of steps uh, ahead of China. It was, it was Putin who really began to clamp down first uh, on NGOs. Uh, and the Chinese followed his lead uh, obviously, there are other takers around the world, so Egypt at the moment, you know, and, and for the last several years, uh, has had campaigns against uh, American uh, and uh, Western NGOs. Uh, so, you know, authoritarian governments are onto um, civil organizations in a way so that they restrict um, their ability to operate. Um, you know, in my sense, in the, the pollution in Beijing uh, example uh, fits here, is that the most important thing is simply to tr promote um, uh, open media, uh, open information, and to let um, citizens of the country take it from there. That it, no matter how hard um, outsiders try, they can't promote uh, or run organizations um, from outside. They really have to provide the information, the ideas, the tools, and let uh, people take it from there. And sometimes, you know, security apparatuses are that tight, uh, it's not going to work, but all you can do is keep going. Do you agree with that title? You know, it, what I found working on this in government and also as a scholar is that the demand exists in every society for voice and accountability. People want their governments to meet their needs. People want to have a, a chance to articulate their own views, pursue their own preferences. And they don't want their government to get in the way of that. Um, what's, one of the things that, that jumped out at me from this year's report, Arch, is the return of what you call crude authoritarian methods in semi-autocracies, countries that used to uh, tout their elections and their um, controlled but, but pluralistic looking press, that had the sort of trappings of democratic politics without the substance. Now, why are they returning to these crude tactics? Because even when you outlaw NGOs or make them register, even when you clamp down on internet freedom, dissent is still there. The demand for voice and accountability is still there. And so these governments are returning to outright repression as a means to control. And what that says to me is it, it, it's never been a question of outside NGOs sort of coming in and dictating. It's always been a question of domestic organizations or just domestic groups of people who are not legally organized or recognized asking for outside information, networking, technical assistance, training. And 
I mean, Arch can tell you much more about this, but freedom of association is one of those basic freedoms in the Universal Declaration. It's one of the metrics that you use in the report. And, you know, the ability of outside uh, communities, human rights activists, you know, uh, businesses, to interact with communities inside these autocratic countries, that's a right in international law as well. If you look at the individual indicators in freedom in the world over the past decade or so, you'll see very little change in political parties. Uh, where you'll see a major change is in uh, freedom of association. So these governments recognize that civil society uh, activists and organizations pose a bigger threat than the old traditional political parties, which very often are weak, marginalized, or co-opted, uh, and which don't pose a uh, threat to the leader. Uh, Putin doesn't regard these, uh, these tamed uh, political parties as, as any kind of a threat to his rule. He regards human rights organizations, the Navalny constituency, and, and, and uh, other uh, less, other groupings that are not organized into political parties but are part of civil society, they pose the threat and they are the targets of repression in ways that traditional political parties are not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we'll go to questions. I have some. We're doing it by cards, so I think there are some of the staff here that can pick up cards if you have some questions. But I want to begin with one. It's kind of an interesting one. Um, it's a bit contrarian. And it reminds me of a discussion that I had in Moscow just a few weeks ago about democracy, freedom, what it all means. And the person that I was speaking to um, was questioning American democracy, US democracy, and saying that, um, you know, how can you call yourself a democracy when you have uh, the death penalty, when you have Abu Ghraib, when you have uh, attacks on young African American men, etc. And this question is kind of in line with that. Please elaborate on how the U.S. can lead the cause of freedom when it seeks enemies to fight and authoritarian leaders overseas to support that fight. Uh, let's have you were with us, Dave. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, actually, this is this is something else that uh, that is highlighted in the Freedom of the World report this year is um, what I think you, you're calling overlooked autocrats, uh, countries like uh, Azerbaijan, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia that the United States partners with on a variety of economic or political or or strategic concerns, and that therefore they get a little bit of a pass in terms of our conversations about uh, autocracy and democracy. And, and this is, I think, a very important thing to highlight at a moment when the United States, uh, with a number of other democratic governments, as well as coalition partners in the Middle East, are now, you know, we're all now embarking on a new uh, campaign against uh, extremist Islamist violence. And yes, we, uh, the United States government is enlisting in that fight uh, a number of notorious autocracies. And you know, if you want any better example of this, you can look at the, the festival of American praise of King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia uh, in the wake of his death last week. And, the, and you know, not only the administration, but a number of members of Congress, former national security advisors and so on who were part of the delegation that, uh, that went to pay a condolence call in Saudi Arabia. Now, you know, states have national security interests that require them uh, to partner with all kinds of people. And diplomacy requires that you engage not only with people you agree with, but also with people uh, where you have common interests on certain things and disagreements on other things. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as long as you, uh, I believe, as long as you are open about those contradictions. it's. It, you know, it's where you sort of pretend everything's okay that I think you run into trouble. Uh, the other point I would make about this is that as we were discussing earlier, and as I think the report documents very well, 
it's weak institutions and lack of voice uh, and the emergence of uh, dissent that has no legitimate channel. Those are the things that make societies vulnerable to the emergence and growth of the kind of terrorism and insurgency that the US is now combating in Syria and Iraq. So if we want to, if we want to deal with this problem in a really <coughs> fundamental way, we can't just deal with it militarily. We also have to be concerned about the nature of governance in these societies and help them. Um, of course, they are the ones who have to do the hard work of compromise, as Arch said, but help them come to compromise and build institutions that function for their people. Uh, and that is what will ultimately deny terrorists the safe haven that they currently have. Aren't you, you know, in, oh, I'm sorry, did you have something? Yeah, actually I did. I, I would have a response to your, to your Russian friends, because right. I think um, that there is a difference between um, the issue of democracy and issues of American foreign policy. I think that the, um, sure, uh, Abu Ghraib was Abu Ghraib and it was horrible, okay? But what, what that has to do with current policy in Russia, this is not the United States preaching perfection. This is the world talking about uh, uh, giving uh, people of the country uh, a say in how it's run. And I think that one of the most common tactics of authoritarian regimes in the last, particularly in the last 10 years, is to divert the subject by trying to um, say, you're not perfect. Who said, you know, this, this is not about America, it's not about perfection, and it's not about America, it's about democracy. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of, there was a Saudi Arabia question, but it was kind of answered there, so I want to move on to kind of get a variety of questions. This one is about women. How does the status of women relate to freedom? Arch, I think this is your question here. Has the status of women declined along with freedom and democracy? <coughs> Well, we have a number of indicators where uh, the treatment of women as second-class citizens would be reflected. Uh, we look at uh, the treatment of all groups in the legal process. Uh, we look at uh, whether all groups can participate in, uh, in politics, uh, in uh, freedom of expression, uh, if, if you look at just about every one of our indicators, uh, you can weave in uh, gender discrimination. And uh, we have at least two indicators where uh, uh, gender issues are reflected in a, in a rather considerable way. Um, the upsurge in terrorism has certainly had a major effect on the status of women in the countries that are involved, especially in, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, in Nigeria, in Somalia, uh, in, in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, the status of women it has declined as terrorism has risen. Um, but aside from that, uh, our I, I have to say that over the years, in most societies, the status of women continues to improve. Uh, that's even, and I, even, I would even say that that's the case in, uh, in African societies, in Middle East societies, in societies where women's status has been uh, historically uh, a major problem. Uh, it's, uh, there, are, there are ways to go in every region of the world but slowly but surely, and because you've got, well, because you've got um, women's advocates in almost every setting in the world today, uh, uh, you've got groups that are pressing <coughs> these changes and that are forcing uh, the political structure to make these changes. Uh, it's not a new era in every part of the world, but it's but the, the direction generally is better than one of the past. And let me just ask you, this is kind of a connected question. If you could briefly answer it, Arch. Um, uh, can you talk about the role that anti-LGBT laws in places like Uganda have played in c contribution to declines in their rankings? Was that part of what you looked at? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, 
uh, LG, uh, well, anti-LGBT laws and practices and general discrimination uh, has been a, uh, a factor in a number of African countries. You know, Uganda being, I'd say, one of the best, but there are others as well. Uh, plus some other societies, uh, and I would point to Russia, where the crackdown on the LGBT activism has been reflected in our scores. Um, having said that, uh, again, uh, this is one of these situations where uh, you've gotten a pushback against the gains that LGBT people have, uh, have registered in Europe, in North America, and in uh, a surprising number of Latin American societies. Um, here's a question from uh, a person who works with Radio Free Asia. How did conditions change in North Korea during 2014? Do we have, um, do, we, do you feel comfortable, or do you want to, is that an arch question? But I'm doing it because I think it's an interesting part of the world. And I have some thoughts, but really, I, I can't uh, say for sure how things are, are, have changed in 2014 in North Korea. I think in general, that we, uh, there are limits to what we know uh, in North Korea. On, on the other hand, we, we know enough. I, I've noticed if you listen for the last 30 years to every American official talk about North Korea, um, there's a formula they start with. Of course, North Korea is a black hole. We don't know anything about it. It, it was repeated so often that I came to think that actually, um, uh, as the National Security Agency has, has now made clear, we do know some things about North Korea, but they don't get made public. So. Thoughts? Um, I, I, I'm uh, not by any means a North Korea expert. In our scoring, over the past three or four <coughs> years, there has been a very, very slight improvement on the issue of, um, well, these uh, DVDs and tapes coming in from China and South Korea, which have uh, enabled uh, some people in North Korea to get a little better sense of what's going on in the outside world, uh, and a, uh, a small measure of capitalism that has uh, intruded on the state control of the economy. I think the, the state is permitting this because they are simply unable to provide for the people themselves. So there, there are more uh, black market merchants that are coming in from China. These things have uh, been more positive than anything else, so they've been reflecting. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a good question for you. It's on social media, and the person who asked this question says uh, Vietnam has 90 million people. I'm hoping that these are correct uh, figures, but uh, 90 million people, 30 million Facebook accounts. What do you see as the future potential? And that gets into this issue of social media in general and how um, you know, expressions through social media um, can strengthen in civil society. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, this is uh, one of those issues that's been debated back and forth uh, ever since the World <coughs> Wide Web uh, emerged. But, you know, it, and you can say uh, that in some ways the, the emergence of Web 2.0 and social media has given new tools not only to activists but to individuals. Um, it's given them new tools for voice. Uh, it's given them new tools to meet others with common interests and create communities of interest and, you know, virtual civil society, if you will. On the other hand, technological tools can also increase the, the uh, capabilities of authoritarian governments to monitor and control. Uh, and, you know, China's been uh, a leader <laughs> in this regard, uh, I'm sorry to say, with lessons that other autocratic governments have, have learned and tried to apply. I think, ultimately, if you look at places like Vietnam with its Facebook penetration or Saudi Arabia, which has incredible Twitter penetration, um, it, it puts a, a burden on these companies. It puts a burden on Facebook. It puts a burden on Google. It per puts a burden on Twitter to think about the ways in which ordinary people are using their product. Um, it, these companies are mining data from all these users uh, and benefiting from them. 
And there's a reciprocal responsibility there uh, to think about the implications of that data collection and those communities for human freedom. Uh, I think some companies have done more thinking about this than others. Uh, you know, Google has spun off Google Ideas as a sort of font of information and, and tools uh, to promote freedom of information on the internet, and uh, they have a corporate value of trying to do that, but they're facing tests in different places. Uh, I think Facebook is struggling with this a lot more. Um, but this is just evidence of the ways in which um, <coughs> You know, free, the Freedom in the World Report doesn't just look at what governments do. It looks at the role of non-state actors. It looks at exogenous factors. And it emphasizes, I think, that uh, corporations have a, a role to play and a responsibility in the trajectory of human freedom worldwide. Jim, do you think there's a difference between freedom and democracy? Yes. Um, well, certainly there's an economic component as well. Um, so, you know, certainly I go back in China to a point where people did not have economic freedom and it was a big deal when I first arrived in China, they were just allowing prices to fluctuate and I watched uh, people try and go out and, and bargain for, uh, for things for the first time. So, you know, in that sense, there's a great deal of freedom. Um, uh, you know, I think freedom is a more expansive concept by far than, than democracy. Um, and that uh, it's therefore, you know, I, I wouldn't conflate the two. Okay, so um, here's a question, a little specific, but I'll try Arch, uh, El Salvador. Would you like to try? I'll give you the question if you uh, want to comment on that. Uh, it is, El Salvador has one of the highest homicide rates in the world. Given the rampant gang violence, uh, how can it be ranked as free? Partly free, like many other Central American countries, seems more appropriate. Well, uh, so El Salvador was one of the countries that I was referring to when I mentioned there was this mixture of narcotics, driven crime, uh, violence, and uh, governments. I would say in El Salvador, um, it has remained free because its political rights scores have been. Uh, quite positive. You have a vigorous party system there. You have had good elections, and when you consider the, oh, you know, the where the starting place for this was back in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, the changes have been quite remarkable. Um, you had you had the conservative party dominating politics for the first uh, fifteen to twenty years after peace, and now you have. Uh, the, the center left party dominating uh, politics there. Um, I would say that that uh, has meant a lot for El Salvador's freedom, plus they have a relatively free press and they have a bigger civil society. Um, you look at uh, these uh, issues like violence, um, but we have a methodology that is, is set up so that if a country has a serious problem in one area, uh, that doesn't necessarily reflect itself throughout all the uh, aspects of freedom, and it can still uh, get a, a free record. Yeah, you know, Jill, there, it, I think it gets back to the point you made earlier about democracy delivering, which relates not only to economics um, and improving uh, development, uh, but it also relates to the rule of law and personal security. And, you know, look at, at Honduras, which had a military coup, uh, in part because the, um, the crime problem was so significant that, you know, it was a different kind of authoritarian bargain. <laughs> um, when that the military is saying, okay, let's provide security in this way that the, that the democratic system was not providing. And, and so I think this is a, a continuing test. Uh, and it also gets back to the point about the link between viol violence and freedom. Um, that, you, you know, there are situations in which um, the threat of violence, whether it's due to terrorism or to, you know, drugs and international organized crime, 
is so severe that people are uh, willing, at least for a period of time, to contemplate giving up their freedoms to a government that promises greater security. I mean, that, that debate comes up in many countries in the region. Uh, we've had the same debate with Brazil. How do you write Brazil is free uh, given the level of violence and the favelas there? Um, we look at all the indicators. We think Brazil merits a free score, but like El Salvador, it's, it's uh, only fair something that we've debated uh, when we have our writing discussions. Uh, there's a question on the Iraq, and um, I think I understand where you're going. I'll read it, and then maybe tomorrow you can kind of comment on this. The U.S. Uh, Iraq War brought to power a sectarian government that the United States continues to support while giving lip service to the need, to the need that it be inclusive of other communities. Do you think U.S. policy can contribute more robustly to supporting Freedom yearnings and Arab Spring youth. Uh, how would you answer that? Uh, well, what I would say is that um, in <clears throat> in the wake of the American invasion of Iraq, uh, there there was an effort to establish inclusive democratic institutions. But this is a divided society um, along sectarian and ethnic lines, uh, and uh, there were a lot of spoilers in that process. Uh, the government that emerged functioned to some degree for a time, uh, but I think was severely tested uh, by the regional environment, by the role of um, outside parties, regional and international, and um, by those underlying societal divisions. And you know, when Maliki started going down the path of, uh, of exclusion, of, you know, uh, shutting down free media, um, restricting the role of Sunni politicians, ultimately, you know, <laughs> indicting on trumped up charges, major Sunni leaders, political leaders, and, and officials in the government, uh, the United States, I would argue, was um, too hesitant to, uh, to press. Uh, and that's, you know, that's partly because as a country, let's be honest, we wanted to be done with Iraq. Uh, but the, the political failure, uh, the weakness of that, um, of pluralism in Iraq, uh, created a situation where ISIS could grow uh, and, and become a threat to American interests, and now we are back. Uh, I think that the current Iraqi leadership is well aware that if they can't get their Sunni population on board, they are not going to be able to hold this country together. They're not going to be able to hold this government together. And there are some tests uh, already underway uh, for, Prime Minister, for Prime Minister uh, Abadi, uh, most notably whether he can get this Iraqi National Guard proposal through Parliament. Uh, and whether he has enough influence with Shia politicians to get them on board with that kind of compromise that's necessary to have Iraqi Sunnis part buy in fully to the Iraqi state. The US has a role to play there, uh, but Iraqi politicians have the lead role, and they're the ones who have to step up. You know, there's a question, um, it's kind of broad. It's in the area that I'm interested in. Please discuss Russia. Oh, well, <laughs> where do we start? Where do we end? But um, maybe we can focus it because then, you know you look at China and there's always that that comparison. But you do have this um, extraordinary situation with Ukraine right now, which has raised all sorts of questions. The um, uh, level of corruption in Ukraine itself, uh, even uh, at the beginning of all of this process, political instability, the inability of political parties to really get it together ever since the, the revolution back in like 2004. Um, and now you have something that people, a situation that is emerging which people are drawing very big conclusions from. That this is not just Ukraine, this is values and how Europe hangs together as a democratic space. So this may be a kind of a broad, but I, it's, it's a broad question. But if you look at Ukraine and the results of Ukraine, are there threats 
that we can say could emerge from this entire situation for democracy in Europe itself? I'm skeptical that uh, Ukraine by itself will affect democracy in out, outside of Central Europe. That's a huge thing. Uh, but let's say uh, Russia's uh, reaction. <coughs> well, uh, I'll let you take that because I'm, sure <laughs> I'm not sure that I have any, any thought. Russia's, Russia's reactions uh, in seeking to defend the first example of a change of, of uh, borders and reoccup reoccupying old borders uh, since World War II um, is of concern, not just in Europe, but everywhere. Um, I think that one uh, of the effects in Europe um, has been to put Germany at the forefront in dealing with Ukraine um, for the rest of Europe in ways that it wasn't before. And for, for those reasons and economic reasons, um, it's putting Germany into a position um, where it needs to define what kind of leader it's going to be. Germans have been very uncomfortable trying to figure out how to deal with Russia on this. And yet, um, for all of the leading negotiations with Putin, it's been Merkel. Um, I, you know, I have trouble, again, seeing beyond that um, how, I, you know, I think Europe's got its own problems, to say the least, and I'm not sure that everything depends on Russia. Mm -hmm. But, but aren't you, in, in that region, you do have the rise in Europe of extremist parties nationalism, um, extremism of uh, left and right, um, fascist groups, extreme leftist groups, etc. There's, there's a considerable amount, of, and anti-immigration groups. So it, um, are you concerned, looking at the report that you have, about perhaps um, bad effects, deleterious effects on democracy in Europe? I think we're worried in the long run uh, that this could be a factor. Um, we have very vigorous discussions about the state of democracy in Europe. Um, we see these new parties rising up. Um, when you have uh, periods of economic decline, it's going to be reflected in your uh, political process. And frankly, I think Europe um, the European political establishment has been comfortable only in a very regulated situation where you have a uh, moderate right party, a moderate left party, and a centrist party competing for power, and um, new ideas are not uh, necessarily welcome. And I think that this, and led to a kind of encrusted uh, political situation. But you've got democracy in Europe, and uh, I think you know, in the, in the long run, they will be more open to change than in uh, other sorts of societies. But um, it is, uh, it, it's obviously something that we do care about. Mm -hmm. What about Azerbaijan? There's a question here. Um, what contributed to Azerbaijan's decline in freedom? Who would like to answer that? Is it uh, rise of political prisoners. Uh, bad elections, um, uh, suppression of the media. Anything else? Uh, <laughs> to start. Uh, well, uh, of course, um, uh, until rather recently, uh, high energy prices, which have uh, uh, empowered uh, Ilham Aliyev uh, uh, to uh, well, that plus, um, I, I would say one further thing, and that is, uh, Azerbaijan has been welcomed into the community of responsible nations by the United States and Europe uh, because A, it has energy wealth, and B, it's pretty independent of Russia. So it's a kind of alternative to uh, Russian uh, energy. Uh, and for these reasons, uh, Azerbaijan gets a pass when it uh, suppresses uh, a journalist that who's actually very well known among the journalist uh, community in, in the West. Um, 
we, we make pro forma objections uh, and don't do much. <coughs> um, there, there's a broad question here which really looks forward and maybe, let's see where we are. Well, you know, this might be a good thing to sum up. Uh, everybody to, can contribute, but um, what will be the biggest challenge on promoting democracy in 2015? And then one of the questions concerns Freedom House. What will Freedom House be doing to help civil society and fight uh, uh, authoritarian against authority and terrorism? But let's start with the, the biggest challenges. You know, when you look at this, which is pretty negative, uh, is it going to continue to? Predict. We're looking at the 2016 report, but would you, Atari, would you do that? Well, I, I would point to a couple things. The first is the fall in oil prices, and um, scholars of, of, uh, of, of democracy uh, have long noted the resource curse, that countries that are able to uh, uh, garner significant resources by pulling it out of the ground or, uh, you know, in other ways don't rely on taxation uh, tends to uh, be authoritarian and stay authoritarian. Uh, so the decline in oil prices could have some very interesting effects on a number of the countries that we've been talking about today. As I said, I think that does create some vulnerabilities in terms of uh, domestic conflict, and I think that's something we have to keep an eye on, but it also might create some opportunities. The challenge for democracy promotion for the United States and, and other concerned countries and I think we do need to remain concerned. Um, I would point uh, to two things. One, as I already mentioned, is our tendency when faced with national security imperatives like counterterrorism, not merely to overlook uh, autocracy, but to overlook the connection between bad governance and security. Uh, th there's a short-termism in our national security approach that we repeatedly fall into that trap. Republican administrations and Democratic <coughs> administrations have done this, and we need to get over that. Um, but the other thing gets back to, to the challenge that you, that you got from your Russian interlocutor. You know, um, autocracies and, and others who point to our failings or our apparent dysfunction, uh, gridlock in Washington, dissatisfaction with Congress, all the indicators that we have that maybe our own democratic process isn't functioning as well as it should. And you know, ultimately, the answer to charges of, well, you have Abu Ghraib is yes, but we, as a democracy, we have mechanisms for self-correction. We have mechanisms for airing these issues in a transparent and equal opportunity way and debating them and changing and fixing our problems. But when we can't demonstrate our ability to do that, uh, then I think it's much, much harder for advocates of democracy to make that argument. Mm -hmm. And so we really do need to strengthen our democracy here at home and be more effective at home if we want to be able to make the case of law. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, first of all, I agree with, with much of what Tamara just said. Um, for countries like China, big authoritarian countries, I think the important thing, well, first of all, what happens in 2015, uh, is, is China is now facing um, uh, a uh, environment of lower growth, and how that's going to that can affect things in a number of ways. I have to keep an eye on that. Um, secondly, um, we need to focus on both promoting openness and information, and being a spokesman simply for that as a value. Um, and one la one last thought: I wanted to come back to something people talked about. We've talked about social media. We think about social media as um, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, the biggest concern for countries like, like China, but I think this is also true whether it's Putin or, or Erdogan, the biggest threat is a simple cell phone. Um, because uh, now to come back to China as an example, they used to worry about uh, uh, demonstrations, uh, riots, whatever, in the big cities. Um, but to assume correctly that if something happened uh, way out uh, in distant provinces that the information wouldn't get out and there'd be nothing to bring it home. Now they can't worry about that. They, try to, um, they can try and monitor YouTube, but one way or another, um, the simple cell phone has been uh, probably an under-recognized um, and probably the most important um, 
for keeping uh, countries uh, at least in some degree of concern about something uh, that would be really uh, visually um, repressive and would bring home to the outside world what's going on. Um, so keeping those channels open, trying to promote openness, uh, and encouraging uh, freedom of the press, something that, of course, uh, journalists in each of these countries uh, are very eager to have on their own, um, are probably one of, one of the most important things we can do. And Archie, I'll leave the last word to you. Um, when, when do you begin? Obviously, we're now into 2015. You're beginning to collect information for the next report. Oh, we are indeed. And um, do you, do, I don't want to steal your thunder, but do you see any patterns at this very early stage, or what would your predictions be for the, the challenges, maybe some improvements over 2015? Um, I think that question is beyond my uh, <laughs> imagination. Uh, I'll just say two things. Um, one, I think it's important for the United States, Europe, and others to pay attention to the countries, not just new democracies like Tunisia, where we know uh, that the institutions are still fragile and the future is very much in contestation. But even for uh, countries that we've seen as where, where countries are settled, but where I think we're seeing that they're not settled, even in Central Europe, for example, where you've seen uh, uh, um, some fraying wear and tear on democratic institutions, where you've seen Russia meddling and uh, trying to influence the political culture, uh, where you've seen uh, political elites who are looking to China, Russia, and other um, uh, authoritarian uh, economic uh, achievers uh, as their models. So there are new democracies in Latin America, in, in Central Europe, and elsewhere where uh, you don't have to spend money, but you have to pay attention to what's going on and uh, start to respond when things are going their own way. Second, I think a, uh, that Ukraine is going to be a major issue. And it is going to be a huge challenge for the United States and Europe. And it's the kind of challenge that is going to require some uh, sacrifices. And um, you know, in this case, it's going to be mainly in Europe that will have to make those sacrifices. But it will require sacrifices. It will, uh, require some strategic coordination and it will require a lot of uh, work together between uh, the uh, between Europe and the United States in order to come up with a strategy that that deals with the economic military and political dimensions of this crisis mm. well on that note um, I think we're out of time and I wanted to thank everybody Tam I can say to my <coughs> Tamara with us, and Jim Mann, and also Arshu, who did a spectacular job. Thank you very much.